Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Do you ever feel like your voice isn't heard? Like your ideas don't matter or you can't influence the world around you? Well, I'm here to tell you you're not alone. But here's the thing. You probably have a lot more influence than you realize. Today, we're going to explore the science of influence and the uncomfortable process of asking and some simple steps you can take to get to a yes. Our guest is Dr. Vanessa Bonds, a social psychologist and professor at Cornell University. Dr. Bonds is the author of You Have More Influence Than You Think, and her groundbreaking research reveals how we can consistently misjudge the power of our words and actions. With over a decade of study in the field, Dr. Bongs brings a wealth of knowledge on social influence, compliance, and the nuances of human interaction. If you want to connect with Dr. Bonds, please connect with her on LinkedIn, on X, and on Instagram. I put links in the show notes. And after you listen to this, you're going to want to buy her book. So I also put a link to that in the show notes. Let's get right to it. Let's lean in and learn from the best. Vanessa, what inspired you to write your book, You Have More Influence Than You Think? And what was the most surprising finding in your research? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And I would say what inspired me to write it was sort of the proliferation of so many books out there on how to get influence. I'm sure All of your listeners and pretty much people everywhere know about Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People and Robert Cialdini's book Influence and all these kind of major, very popular even to this day, even though Carnegie's book was written in the 30s, it's still, you know, like a top 100 Amazon book every time I ever look it up. And plus many, many, many more resources on this, right? So I would see just almost like this glut of resources on how to get influence. And I don't begrudge them at all. I think they're great books. Like they are honestly wonderful books. I think I'm happy for people to read them. But seeing that and then going to graduate school and being a social psychologist and sort of seeing one of the key takeaways in social psychology, which is that we influence people all the time every day. You know, we would read these studies about how you walk into a room and you change the tenor of the room or, you know, something you say, people remember later on. And it just seemed like, wow, we have such a huge impact on people. And yet people are just gravitating towards all these resources about how to get influence. And so kind of drawing on my own research along those lines, and then looking at all this research that is more recent, but also research I had read back in graduate school, I kind of wanted to make the case that we don't necessarily need all those resources. They're fine. They're great to read. Again, I definitely don't want to take any readers away from that stuff. But I wanted to explore the idea of why is it that we think we need that stuff to have influence? Like Even just without that, just being ourselves, our every ordinary, everyday selves, we are impacting people all the time. And I wanted to make that case. Okay. So what was surprising about what you found in this exploration? Yeah. I mean, I think I was surprised at how many different places this kind of played out. So my sort of basic claim is that we underestimate our influence. And so that's why we gravitate towards these resources to kind of gain influence. And that's based on a lot of my own research where I had for now it's been like 15 years, I've been doing research on asking for things and how much more likely people are to agree to things we ask for. And so basically how we underestimate our ability to get people to do things. And so that was surprising when I first started, but after, you know, 15 years of seeing it again and again and again, it was like, okay, this is, I feel like this is very established in my mind, but then kind of looking into other areas and seeing that other people were finding similar things. Like we also underestimate how much other people like us. We underestimate how sort of social and connected we are to other people And it started to seem like a pattern, like we generally kind of underestimate ourselves. And I was surprised by that. I kind of thought that mine was like this little unique sort of finding and that I wasn't sure if I'd find it all over the place, but I just found it everywhere, this tendency to underestimate ourselves. That's interesting. So what biases lead to that? Yeah. So there's several different biases depending on sort of the domain that you're underestimating yourself in. So I'd say there's kind of an overarching explanation, which is that 
a lot of the impact that we have on other people, a lot of other people's actual opinions of us, we never get to see. So a lot of it is just invisible to us. And so if we can't see it, you know, it doesn't exist in our mind. So if we, you know, make a comment and someone doesn't immediately in that moment tell us like, you changed my mind, we assume we didn't, right? If we post something on the internet and we only get a couple of likes, we assume lots of people didn't see it. But what the research shows is that, in fact, there's an invisible audience out there that sees our posts. There's an invisible audience that sees us in real life, that people think about the things we say after we've said them when we're not there to see them sort of processing that. And so that kind of just, I only know what I have access to, what I see Mm -hmm. is kind of an overarching bias that I think applies to a lot of these, these different contexts. That's so true. I mean, I think we all want influence because it's how we think things are going to get done. If I want a new job, I need to gain influence. I mean, we live in the world of influencers, and that's something I want to talk about later. But right now we're playing out an election season, right? Both parties are trying to gain influence. And so it's really as old as time, I think, and that people are trying to, if you want to climb the ladder, if you want to gain status and the social structure, You need more influence. So what are some practical ways that we could leverage influence in a positive way to improve our professional and personal lives? Like if we underestimate it, then how do we really level set on the level of influence that we have and then actually use it appropriately? Yeah, so it's interesting bringing up the election and kind of more sensitive political questions too. This this comes up a lot. And I, I wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago about why we shout to get our point across and why that doesn't work. And one of my arguments is that that really stems from us underestimating our influence. So when we underestimate our influence, we do one of two things. We either don't ask for things or don't voice our opinion because we assume there's no point right? So I'm not even going to tell people what I think about this candidate. No one's actually listening, or I'm not going to ask for this raise that I could use because there's no point. This person isn't going to say yes to me. And so we hold back. And that can be a mistake because in many cases, people would listen and would do the things that you know we want them to do. On the other hand, though, if we underestimate our influence, but we still feel really strongly about that thing, we kind of come in with guns blazing. We're just like, you know, I am going to yell at you and tell you what you need to believe when, in fact, people don't react well to that. And so it kind of defeats the purpose. And if we had just kind of said, this is my opinion, it actually would have gone a lot further than kind of coming in and like making this super strong case for your opinion where people kind of dig their heels in and don't want to hear it. Right. And so I think calibrating, accurately calibrating your the influence you actually have, like people are going to listen to me, but it's not going to be immediate. It's not going to always be so obvious. And if I just assume that my voice has value and my requests, like people will actually take my requests seriously, I ask them with the right tone, with the right degree of sort of confidence, emphaticism, but not like being so argumentative. And we wind up doing better that way. You mentioned something earlier that perked up my attention. How do we ask for things, I guess, in a better way? I think a lot of us are embarrassed to ask for help or we're in a negotiation or in the world I'm in, you're raising capital, right? It can be uncomfortable to ask for things. So do you have any strategies around that? Yeah, so that question, actually, there's a lot to unpack in because there's sort of the question of what's the best way, the most effective way to ask? How are you most likely to get a yes? And that's one question. Then it's like, why is it so awkward to ask? And how can you make it more comfortable for you to ask? And actually, those things can kind of play against each other in problematic ways. And then I always add this additional question, which is, how do we ask in ways that don't pressure other people? Because I think we focus so much on asking to get what we want, that sometimes we wind up asking in ways that put pressure on people that we don't necessarily intend to. And so to sort of address those first two points, The sort of three things I usually say about asking are, first of all, actually just ask, because (laughs) the biggest thing we do is we hold ourselves back and we say there's no point in asking. They would just say no. Ask face to face. So this is kind of where this tension plays out, because asking over email is a lot more comfortable for people. I can write out my perfect request and I don't have to look someone in the eye. But 
it's actually a lot less effective for getting a yes. And so kind of actually looking someone in the eye, doing that uncomfortable thing, talking to them face to face, If you can't do it face-to-face, a phone call can be just as effective, we found, or not as effective, but at least better than email. What about Loom? Uh, Zoom, yeah. So we actually, we have some studies where we compared in-person to phone to Zoom and email, and nothing is as good as in-person. So that's, I should clarify that. But phone and Zoom are about the same. So as long as you're kind of hearing that that's a real person, getting some of those naturalistic features of the interaction, it was better than email. Email was like the worst possible way to ask people. And then the third thing is directly ask for what you want. So people tend to beat around the bush and say like, it'd be great if you could do this. But when you actually make, will you do this is a much more effective ask if the goal is to get something, right? Then like, do you think you could do this? Are kind of being more indirect. If you've learned something today on how to get to yes, do me a favor, leave us a rating and written review on whichever listening platform you are joining us from, as this goes a significant way in helping us build and grow the show. Let me recap this because this is really important, I think. Number one is just ask. Number two is face-to-face. And then number three is ask in a direct way. Yeah, I'll add one more, which is what I usually end all my talks with and all my lessons is assume you're gonna get a yes. So if you go into the interaction, assuming you're gonna get a yes, you go into it with that, that nice tone we were talking about, right? You're not pushing too hard, but you're not being too meek. You're like assuming this person's going to say yes. So you're kind of confident, but not overconfident. And at the same time, you're going to ask for what you really think you deserve, right? If I'm going to get a yes, and I, I'm going into that assuming that, I'm not going to sort of negotiate with myself before I negotiate with the other person and be like, well, how do I get them to yes? It's like, no, assume that they're going to say yes to whatever I ask for. So what do I really think I should ask for in this moment. This is good stuff. This is really good stuff. It's hard. It's very uncomfortable. And people that don't feel uncomfortable, I really envy that. Maybe it's repetition over time. You mentioned Zoom. Something that I've seen that's very effective, I have friends in the sales world, and they love to make introductions using these video email introductions where it's their face. You can't say no, right? But what I found helpful recently is I've just been using Loom. And when I know somebody, I'm just going to take the extra time if I have an important message I want to get across to just record this. So they see my face and they see the sincerity and like I'm trying to convey. And I think that that's more effective. What do you, I mean, you mentioned Zoom, obviously face to face is best. But if you're trying to make an email introduction or you're trying to kind of crack in on something, like maybe you're trying to apply for a job and you want to use some influence, is that maybe like a video intro of yourself directly to that person that's personalized? Well, I'll say I actually have some data on that, although it's not exactly about introductions. But Uh that study that I mentioned where we compared email to Zoom to phone to -to face-to-face, we had another study part of that package where we were curious about things like phone calls and Zoom? Is it about the synchronous nature of the interaction? Is it because the other person has to respond right then? Or is it about the sort of humanizing features, the face, the sound of someone's voice? And so we wanted to unpack those things. And so we compared a Zoom call where it's synchronous and you see someone's face to a video message like you're talking about, where it's not synchronous, but you still get to see like the emotion and the naturalness. And those are pretty much the same we found and still not as good as face-to-face. Like it really, at the end of the day, better than email and not as good as face-to-face. So I get some of those when people are trying to introduce themselves. And I very much prefer to kind of have the option to either be introduced just by text or click on that. Like if someone says like, hey, you know, click on this to get to know me or something, and I'm sure it would be more professional sounding than that. But I want to know whether it's even worth clicking first. Like I need to get through that initial sort of introduction. So I definitely would still want that sort of text introduction. That makes sense. I just think that there's something to this that can be leveraged to really create an authentic relationship. And the more that we're moving to 
you know, we have these amazing technologies on our phone now where we can FaceTime. Just think about that. Like 15 years ago, we weren't FaceTiming. And now we can actually look at each other face to face. COVID really changed a lot of things. And I think sped up a lot of these technological innovations. I really try to make sure that when I position my camera, it's in such a way that I the person actually feels like I'm looking at them instead of like, the worst was like when COVID first started and you're getting like the side of their face, you know, it was just awful. But I think we're getting to a point with the computer vision where we can make things a bit more authentic. In regards to social media, now we have this term social media influencer. And people really want to gain influence through these different TikTok or Instagram or LinkedIn now. What do you see as the positives and negatives about this? For me, I think it really distorts the reality for a lot of people of what social media is and who's out there because we primarily see these people with tons of followers and tons of influence, you know, these influencers. And so we compare ourselves to them. We think they kind of speak for the majority of the population because we see their opinions more. And there's so many people out there, the average number of followers, or at least the median number of followers, you know, of course, is much, much, much lower. And when you're on these social media sites, like you're, the algorithm is having you engage with other people like that as well. They're seeing your posts as well. And so it can make us feel like we have less influence than we do because we feel like that is the definition of influence. And I think it can really just distort reality for people and what most people sort of think because it's so concentrated, right? It's this concentrated attention. I'm curious, what type of people in the world of business are consuming your research? Because you're holding two things in your head. One, if I have more influence, if I have an idea, especially if it's going to be helpful, right? It can do good. Then you want to leverage these tools. At the same time, there's some pretty malicious people out there. And so I'm just curious, are there people not, I mean, you're at a prestigious university as well. Are there people like knocking down your door that you're a little bit like, huh, that's interesting. I have had requests from companies like multi-level marketing companies and places where I'm like, you know, I don't actually feel so comfortable like giving a talk to that particular audience. So there's definitely that. I'd say that there's like three groups. There's people who just want to feel like they have more influence and can on like their teams, more of this management. I want to be a better leader. I want to get promoted. I want to just learn how to have influence in this context. Then there's the salespeople, like people who really want to use it in, you know, negotiation or marketing and sales. And then interestingly, there's the HR people who we usually focus more on the flip side, which I kind of alluded to earlier, which is that there's all these ways we could talk about to have more influence to get what you want. But there's also the concern about putting pressure, unnecessary pressure on people. And so we talk a lot about sort of the responsibility that comes with influence and how to sort of navigate that. You know, you want to ask for things, but you want to do it in a way that doesn't put pressure on people, that doesn't put people in uncomfortable situations. And so we really focus a lot on on the flip side of that. What are you researching now? Like what currently has your attention? I'm just interested, like people that are in, in the academic world are typically a few years ahead, like the stuff that you're working on now, we're going to see it in a few years. So what has your attention right now? So my research has gone from, and this kind of follows what I was saying, from looking at compliance and getting to yes, to looking at when compliance and consent are rubbing up against each other and you're not really sort of that line, that fine line between compliance and consent. How to get from more than, I often say, get to more than just yes. So like my old research was like how to get to yes more. And now it's like how to get to more than just yes, how to actually get buy-in, how to actually get someone to consent, to really know what they're agreeing to, to really voluntarily agree to that thing. And so that's definitely just kind of identifying like what is the line between compliance and consent has been kind of an obsession of mine in the past couple of years. Okay, in what context is this, I'm signing up for a product, is this corporate compliance, meaning I, I'm now a task with something and yes, I'm consenting to do it, but I'm really compliant and all in. What arenas are you focusing on? Yeah. So all of the above. And I feel like since I started researching this question, it just, I'm seeing it everywhere. So our most recent project, which is currently in the works, we're looking at 
complying with basically essentially legally consenting. So you're signing your name on like an employment contract. So you might sign away certain rights. You might have to take down your social media, you know, profile. You might have to be monitored in a certain way. You might have to sign a mandatory arbitration agreement. There might be some undesirable things that you sign or even tasks that you would rather not do or travel you would rather not do. And so we're looking at how being at that moment of signature, if you really feel like you're truly consenting and know what you're agreeing to and how that affects these downstream outcomes. Like later on, do you want to leave your job? Do you enjoy your job or not? And we're also looking at what happens when you're the person asking for a signature. Do you realize if you're giving this person enough information to actually consent? Like, are you actually getting them to consent? Are you just like throwing them some papers and asking them to sign it away? So that's one context. And then, but also, you know, I talk a lot about all these contexts where we're like constantly just downloading terms in it or clicking on terms and agreements to download new apps and updates and have no idea what we're quote unquote consenting to. My favorite example of this, so I've been studying this for a few years now and my family and I went to Universal Studios in Florida. Uh Uh-huh. We buy these expensive tickets and we take a flight there and we get up early in the morning and we line up, you know, in this huge line. I've got little kids who are like itching to go in. We get to the front of the line and they ask for our fingerprints, like electronic fingerprints. And I was like, I did it, right? But I had very little idea. We asked them what they were doing with the fingerprints, how long they were keeping them, but I have very little idea of what I was consenting to. I definitely didn't feel like it was a free choice because I'm like, there's no way at this point I'm backing out, right? So I just, I'm starting to see it everywhere. These consent moments that don't feel like consent. I am with you. I recently traveled and all of a sudden they wanted a picture of my face. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, what's going on here? And look, I don't have anything to hide. I understand that if you're trying to keep people from doing nefarious things, then I'm more than willing to help in that process. But the big ones that get me are like these big tech companies, because I work in technology, and they're like, hey, to continue to do X, Y, and Z, here's the new forms. And it's like 50 pages. And you're like, there's no way I can read all of this and understand it. I guess chat GPT would be very helpful in that situation. But even then, it runs out of memory. But those type of like, I think that, you know, I don't really want to get on the AI discussion, but like, that's where AI agents are going to be really helpful because you'd be able to take that, put it into an agent and say, hey, from a legal perspective, what am I consenting to in terms that an eighth grader could understand? I do that a lot right now with different things, and it saves me a lot of time and a lot of heartache. It'll point out things very quickly. That's the benefit of some of those things. I think that could be an interesting twist on research is how AI agents could help with consent. And I think some of these companies are no longer able to hide behind what I call legalese. This is fascinating information. This is stuff that we all think about consciously or subconsciously is our influence. Every day, I'd say most of Americans are on social media for something, some reason, And you're faced with this all the time. And we're in a season right now in our country where influence is everything. And and these candidates are trying to gain influence over you so that you would make a decision. And I really appreciate you sharing this information. Thanks again for joining us on the Blueprint Podcast. And make sure to hit that subscribe or follow button on whichever listening platform you are joining us from. And until next time, stay curious, stay consistent, and keep chasing excellence. 